This video is a re-recording of my earlier video on the same subject, a complete guide to general relativity. I am extremely sorry and my kind apologies for the poor quality and the distraction which has caused due to my new mic on the earlier video. I am extremely thankful to all my subscribers who have pointed me out the error and have told me to make this video. It proves that my subscribers really want to watch this video and they really love the subject. So I think that this audio is quite clear and I can live up to the standard of producing a clear video with a clear audio. My name is Shaunak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. I welcome you to my channel. Now this video is a complete guide to general relativity. Uh, this would be one complete video which will take you through a complete journey of Einstein's general relativity. It would cover up right from the beginning till the end all the essential components starting from basic to the advanced level. Uh, we will be covering mostly the important components of general relativity. It would be mostly uh, on developing the ideas, concepts, including certain equations, but it will be quite clear, easy to understand and going back to the roots and getting a complete grasp of this subject. I think that I can meet up to the expectation and now the audio part is clear. So before we start and go ahead with the video, let us see what are the topics that we are going to cover. So first we will cover what is general relativity and why it is important. A quick overview on the general idea of general relativity. What are the postulates of general relativity? What are tensors? What is a metric tensor and what are, that is the fundamental component of GR? We are also going to cover Christoffel symbols which I was telling that I would cover in the next video. I would cover a basic comparison which would be easy to understand between Christoffel symbols and Newtonian gravity. We will cover the main tensors which are involved in order to measure curvature including Riemann curvature tensor, parallel transport, covariant derivative, Ricci curvature tensor, Ricci scalar as well as the stress energy momentum tensor. We are also going to see how tidal forces uh, creates an effect on GR and what are the geodesic deviations and finally why do we use and what are the usage of Einstein's field equations. So these are more or less the topics that we are cover and I think that it is a good time to start. First before going ahead with the video we need to understand why general relativity is important because we are reading this subject, we are understanding the complex mathematical calculations, but what is the need and why should we understand this subject comes first. Now, uh, before we start, we need to understand that Newtonian gravity has its limitations. Now, I am very, um, I, I'm a little bit skeptic and I, I generally tend to speak a little bit low when we talk of limitations, but actually there is no limitation to any scientific theory. Any scientific theory is good in its own perspective, in its own framework. However, we still get certain erroneous comments like Newtonian gravity is not right or Newtonian gravity is wrong. No. Till now, whatever the calculations that we are doing are all based on Newtonian mechanics. So Newtonian mechanics is absolutely perfect. But Newtonian gravity has got its limitation and sometimes gives wrong, incorrect predictions which general relativity describes. For example, the solar system, Newton's law are incapable of predicting the orbits, especially the perihelion of Mercury. Uh, general relativity describes new phenomena which the old Newtonian gravity has got its limitation. For example, black holes and uh, uh, extension up to gravitational waves and, uh, you know, predicting uh, gravitational waves, all those things. So this is totally unique to uh, the GR. Uh, it gives us a new, whole new understanding of space-time because the way we used to perceive space-time has been completely changed. 
uh, general relativity actually opens some new areas of research which is going on uh, uh, probably at some point of time we can think about quantum gravity which involves a lot of active research in general relativity other uh, areas of research would be cosmology astrophysics singularity big bang including dark matter and energy the big bang and even the structure of planets and stars so these are more or less we can say that that is this is basically the importance of general relativity and why should we learn that okay uh, first we what we would go in the first part of the video we are going to take a very quick overview in a basic understanding of general relativity then we will delve more deeper into the, its components and get a better idea okay first we need to understand that the laws of physics to a a uh, universal form that is a basic objective what dr does so general relativity uh, if i go to the root is the generalization of the law of physics to universal covariant form which is why the mathematics are complex now don't worry what is universal covariant form we will <coughs> going to understand that but let us understand that things should vary in a way which is nice and predictable it should vary in relation to some variable or something which gives mathematicians and physicists a better way to understand uh, mathematics also happen and to have a geometric interpretation uh, which corresponds actually to the notion of space time being curved that means it has got a geometric interpretation now if i take a kind of a simple cartesian coordinates and name it as x and y then when i plot it on a curved surface like this right we get a x prime and a y prime kind of a thing so what happens is that we will look general relativity from the geometric point of view so you can see that the uh, the 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 flat uh, the flat coordinates when it gets into a kind of a curvilinear coordinates uh, this becomes when the space time gets curved so we will look uh, general relativity from the geometric point of view why because it is much more easier to understand visualize and get a quick concept rather than going deep into the mathematical interpretations so the mathematics of general relativity gives an accurate description of nature regardless of the change in coordinates so our basic objective of this video if i can tell is to look it in a geometrical point of view which will give a better visualization okay so what are the key points that we are going to cover first of all we need to understand that space time which was visualized or you can say calculated by newtonian or pre relativistic era was that you have a spatial dimension a length breadth and height and then you have a time dimension which is t now this in relativity i mean to say both special and general uh, something it is called space time so both of them are clumped up in a kind of a space which is called space time so put it simply this means that instead of thinking about space and time uh, and the three special special dimensions as separate things we describe it as a four dimension space time so it is clumped up in one place which is called space time second thing is that to describe something in space time what we need is a coordinate system right so coordinate systems can be chosen freely but universal laws of physics should not depend on any particular system now say for example this is a man in one coordinate system and any kind of an event is happening say for example is throwing a ball or whatever now if this person uh, takes uh, you know throws the ball in a rotated kind of a coordinate right so this is the flat one and this is the rotated one we should measure the events in all in the same way in all frames of reference right this is the key point number one is that space and time are no longer different they are clumped up in a kind of a lump which is called space time universal laws of physics should not depend on any particular coordinate so the person i have just given a very abrupt uh, um, i would say uh, demo so the person throwing the ball at any event happening when it is rotated stretched or whatever the same event happens but we should be able to measure it and it should not depend on any particular coordinate system this is the second one third one would be the laws of physics and gravity are described in the form of tensor 
I've just shown metric tensor. Uh, because tensors are a kind of a mathematical object, which actually gives us a tool to, de uh, to uh, denote something which does not depend on any coordinates, which means that they can be used and formulated in whatever way that the physical laws are universal. So here I have uh, mentioned that metric tensor describes how distances are measured in a space-time and it is used to turn specific coordinates to use. So uh, these are the three important points we should remember. That first is that space-time is not different, it is space-time together. Universal laws of physics should not depend on a particular coordinate system. Whatever the coordinates rotation stretching happens, we would be able to measure them. And tensor is a kind of a mathematical object, we will look further into it, which will give us an advantage to measure those changes and things will remain invariant and won't change so that it becomes easier for us to calculate. Okay, so now we get to understand what are the components of a metric tensor. Now, this is basically the metric tensor. Before going ahead, I would just like to give the viewers a note. If you are interested to understand a complete derivation and a complete understanding of metric tensor, in my playlist in general relativity, I have got a complete detailed video on just metric tensor. You can look into it right from the starting till the end i have only described about metric tensor it com it uh, covers up a to z everything about metric tensor so this one ds square is basically a line element of the euclidean space metric uh, th this is the g nu mu this g nu mu or the new actually mu gives the indices which denotes any given space time uh, that that is important this part is actually the coordinate displacement that means how much the coordinate have changed and the metric tensor convert these coordinate distances into real physical distances so this is all in all just to let you know that what is the function and how the metric tensor looks like metric tensor is very central and that is why i made a complete separate video quite detailed along with the derivation how it will appear there i have not used nu mu i have used j sub ij however the indices doesn't matter Okay, so if you are a little bit wondering about what is a line element, so I have given it, I think I don't need to go further for the explanation. It is just the curve line and the R plus DR element. Okay, any, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, any kind of a scientific uh, theory would be incomplete until and unless there are certain postulates. So the first postulate is the principle of equivalence. Now, why do we call equivalence? We will come to that because I want to give you a very clear idea. So, the principle of equivalence is quite simple. I think you already know gravitation and inertial forces are similar and they cannot be distinguished. Gravitational force as experienced while a person is locally standing is the same as the pseudo force experienced by an observer in a non-inertial frame of reference. That means uh, in a frame of reference which is experiencing acceleration. Okay, so this is a kind of a nice figure which will give you, so a person standing on the earth is feeling the kind of a pressure on his feet and the person who is accelerating upwards either on an elevator or on a spaceship will experience the same amount of weight on his feet. So that actually gives a kind of a thought experiment by Albert Einstein to mention that the gravitational inertial force are indistinguishable. I've just given the same kind of an example on what is called a Gedanken or the thought experiment which Einstein performed at his physics office at Bern that if this person is dropping a kind of a marble or a ball and the same person is dropping it on the elevator it happens in the same way. Only the thing is that you will see that if you if you shine a light or this 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 ball which is falling will have a kind of a curvature. So, if you fire a light uh, while the person is accelerating, the light ray will bend, which eventually means that the space-time is curved. However, this is basically an example of the space-time uh, equivalence, the equivalence principle. 
Okay, so next we come to what is called a Riemann tensor. We will come to this part later. This is how it looks like. Riemann curvature tensor is a standard way to express curvature. It assigns tensor to each point on a Riemannian manifold. Again, if you are not aware about what is a Riemannian manifold or a little bit more about Riemann tensor, I, I have made a video, uh, the second part, Fundamental Concepts of General Relativity, which you can go and check where it contains more about what is a Riemannian manifold, what is a manifold, etc. So, the tidal forces in general relativity are described by a tensor, which is called the Riemann tensor. So, now we already know till now that tensor is something which helps us to measure things in case that the coordinates are stretching or changing. And Riemann tensor will actually assign tensor at each and every point so that we can understand and measure the curvature. So, Riemann tensor also has a nice geometric meaning. That means we can describe the curvature of space. So, this is uh, another key point that Riemann tensor is a standard way to express curvature. Okay, next important point is that what is a geodesic? Now, fundamentally, if I talk, geodesics are just straight lines, or we can say the shortest distance which a particle travels. Now, if we got these two points and we want to move, we get a straight line. Further, we get a triangle or any kind of a shape and we get these two points where the geodesic is again a straight line. If we get kind of a curved surface like this and we get again two points, then the straight line, definitely it is a straight line, but it will curve. Now, this is a kind of an again a, a curvature. Here also we get two points and also here the shortest point is the curvature or the straight line. Now, this is an example which I used in my earlier video, very, very nice example. Given a tram line and you get a kind of a tram path and you ask a mathematician that how and where the tram will move. So, mathematician will say that we can use Newton's second formula, uh, second law F equals to MA. And if it is a second order partial, you give me, uh, you know, second order differential, you give me two conditions, I will plug in and get the kind of an uh, initial and final, we get the kind of a uh, path that the tram will follow. However, if you ask a rickshaw puller or anybody, uh, a layman, then they will trade that the tram will path travel in this way, which is shown in red. That means the tram will exactly follow the path which is laid down. This has been a very famous example by one of the greatest mathematicians from India, AKR, Amol Kumar Chaudhary, and he expressed it this way in one of the interviews. So, what we get is that geodesics, to be simple, are the shortest path between two points. Whatever be the path, it is the shortest point between two points. So, that means if I get a straight line and if I extend this straight line to kind of a curvature, so we can tell that geodesic generalizes the notion of straight line to curve space time, which further means that this curvature, which is which is this down and up, this is the gravity, and gravity is due to the curved space time, and hence what causes the gravity? What is the source of the gravity? It is called a stress energy momentum tensor, which we are going to deal uh, in this video. It is a source which causes the curvature, and the curvature. Is <clears throat> the curvature is known to be as gravity. So, what we can tell is that an object moves through space time in a straight line, which is called geodesic. But if the space time is curved, that means gravity is present, this line will follow the curvature and it may change the direction. Now, when I say this line will follow the curvature and gravity is present, I, I don't mean to say that otherwise the gravity is not present. But here, gravity means that it is a curvature and the particle will follow the natural path, which is the geodesic. So, we call this effect, that is a curve one, we call it as gravity. <coughs> this is important because these are few of the key points on which we will be building further notions of this video. So, understand that the generalized notion of Euclidean space, a straight line, is being generalized as a curved space-time. In, in curved space time. And what causes the curvature? The stress energy tensor. And the stress energy tensor causes the curvature, which that curvature is basically manifestation of the space time and we call it as gravity. 
So a geodesic is essentially just a straight line which an observer does not experience any force or acceleration. Now if I take the equation of geodesic then this part actually measures the rate of change of objects of four velocity. I think you know about four velocity. In special relativity only we have read that it is an extension of three velocity to four velocity addition of space time by Einstein. This tau measures the uh, the proper time uh, the person is moving. This part is actually the four velocities of the object, four velocity multiplied by four velocity. And this gamma term is the Christoffel symbol. It denotes how are the space time coordinates changing due to space time curvature. We will deal with this Christoffel symbols in this video. So, this is actually how the geodesic equation looks like. And these are the components of the geodesics so that you can understand how uh, the components are related, which was is the Christoffel symbol, rate of change of velocity, proper time, and four velocities multiplied by four velocity. So, this is the equation, and we can tell finally that gravity is not a force rather a manifestation of the geometry of space-time. This is the crux of relativity, that it is just a manifestation of space-time, which the particle uh, experiences through the geodesic, which is a movement. Okay, we have just taken into account a basic, uh, I would say, a summarized form of Einstein's field equations. Uh, so now, this is actually the Einstein tensor G, it is built from the second derivatives of the metric and Christoffel symbols. Uh, this describes the space-time, structure of space-time. C4 obviously is the C, uh, speed of light. Why it is to the power 4? We will look into it later, not in this video, to keep in the dimension analysis better. This T mu nu, which we are going to do, is basically the stress energy momentum tensor. And it describes how moment, uh, energy is distributed. And these are the few of the co uh, constants. Eight, and pi and the capital G of Newton's constant. So the sources of gravity are described by Einstein's field equation. These describe how things such as energy, momentum, pressure, shear stress, shear strain, etc. causes the curvature of space-time. So we move, now move on to what are called the postulates of general relativity. Again, as I was telling that any scientific theory would be incomplete without understanding the postulates. Here, postulates are the key part in understanding general relativity because uh, we, will, we will soon see why these postulates are important. Okay, the first postulate which we have already discussed, now we will cover a little bit in details, which is called the principles of general covariance, which means that the laws of physics themselves should be independent of an observer's motions. Obviously, whatever, wherever the observer is moving, whatever the coordinate system is, the laws of physics should be the same. The second one which we have already dealt in is called equivalence principle. The gravitational acceleration is the same for all observers in a gravitational field. Now, because gravitational um, acceleration and inertial force, these things are almost equivalent if we consider certain general conditions. That is why it is called equivalence, that means equal. But it is not equal. Remember, it is equivalent. Equivalent and equal is not the same. So that is why it is called the equivalence principle. Now, this principle of general covariance, when we use this term covariance, this covariance actually leads to the uh, concept of tensors, why we will see soon. And the equivalence principle actually shows that gravity is not a force. It is a geometric property of space-time. It cannot be distinguished from acceleration. So based on those two postulates, we will uh, the, the, the entire edifice of general relativity is based on. Okay, first of all, let us understand, this is very important, although it sounds very rudimentary, however, this is very important. So, covariance or covary actually is made up of two terms, co plus vary, which means it should vary, but with a co, means with a company or with something. Let us explain it in a few uh, illustrations. So, if I get a kind of an arrow like this, for example, it moves in this way. And if it moves in this way, then it is predictable or 
in relation to some variable it will also move in this way so we can call it covariance now suppose we get another arrow which moves in this way which implies that it will also move in this way and then it will move in this way and ultimately it might vanish so this can also be called covariance right that means a variable or a change which is happening in relation or in uh, coordinates uh, in coordinates with a variable so we can tell that to vary together with another variable particularly in a way that may be predictive that means we can predict we can measure what is a covariance so a tall person very tall will have a covariance with a fat person so very tall person will have a uh, you know um, a kind of a very a heavy weight but remember one thing that a covariance term is also used in statistics right the philosophy of the fundamental meaning in statistics and in general relativity or mathematics is the same both of them means in relation or in correspondence with each other but just don't forget that it is also used in statistics however we are trying to use it in a different meaning that means there are some predictable changes there are some changes in general relativity or coordinate system which is happening and we are trying to register that change with a kind of a uh, mathematical tool now the principle of general covariance so i have shown that this person throws a ball and this also person throws a ball but in a rotated axis then these are the two same events are happening but we will be able to measure it in the same way whatever be the frames of reference now if i take this person again who is throwing a kind of an object and if i get this person throwing the same object but in a stretched frame of reference or we have extended the frame of reference these are just analogies so that you can understand well there also we must be able to measure it in the same way right we would be able to measure it in the same way now i am just giving another kind of a geometric meaning so if this is a sphere and we may you know measure the latitude or whatever the line and if this sphere gets extended it extends to what is called an oblate spheroid and if i draw the line you see the line is much more longer the line is much more longer that means it is stretched here also we will follow the same rule events will be measured in the same and that is what einstein expressed in his famous line the general laws of nature must be expressed by identical equations relative to all other systems whichever way they are moving the last line is very important whichever way way they are moving that means just stretching contraction rotation extension whatever happens the principle of general covariance tells that we would be able to measure the laws of physics in the same way whichever the way they are moving so this is a nice demonstration which will help you to understand what i mean by the principle of general covariance so <clears throat> the equivalence principle again coming back to that it says the same thing that gravitational and inertial forces are often indistinguishable gravitational force as experienced locally and this part we have already shown right the light rays bends so yeah this part i think we have shown this the light rays bends this is the same equivalence principle so <clears throat> this is uh, what i tell that the, the the discovery of equivalence principle of einstein and the falling of the apple by isaac newton both of them are very important so we might call einstein's newton apple insight because the discovery of the gravitational force which newton did at wolfsthorpe when he was lying uh, resting on his uh, um, you know garden um, apple orchard the same way einstein discovered it at his swiss office at bern uh, so this is einstein's newton apple insight because both of them are revolutionary now this is the same thing Uh, the photon emitter as the as the as the space shuttle kind of a moves up this is the apparent path of photon which appears to be curved and this is be used by einstein what is called a gedanken the german word for thought experiment so here from he deduced that there is nothing called gravity it is an internalized structure of space time and gravitational and inertial forces are often indistinguishable so the question arises in einstein mind is what is that bends light 
and that is what is the space-time curvature. Yeah, so here you see that is this a space-time curvature. So where do we get from here? We find that since all objects experience the same acceleration due to gravity, uh, irrelevant of the shape or mass of the object, we can say that gravity acts very differently to other forces. For example, electric force will depend on the charge of the object, but gravity is the same for all object. Second thing is that uh, this can be interpreted as gravity being a geometry property of space-time. Uh, like the logic is fundamental, gravity equals to space-time curvature. Gravity cannot be distinguished from acceleration. Uh, we have given the typical example that if you are accelerating in a closed elevator, it is impossible for you to determine whether gravity is pulling you down, keeping your feet you know, to the ground or whether the box is accelerating upwards. Also the tidal forces, there is one exception. Tidal forces come from the fact that object get stretched or sphagetified in a gravitational field because the different parts experience different force and we will see later in certain examples. And space-time is curved if an object experiences real tidal force and thus there is a real physical gravitational field present. So I, I mean to say this is more or less what we have summarized till now, a quick overview on certain elements of the general relativity. Okay, so then now we come to the integral part that most of the mathematics of relativity is based on tensors. Why do we need tensors? Okay, so first a general idea. Tensors are this kind of a mathematical objects which are used in GR. So a tensor is a tool, right, which measures the changes, but it is same in each coordinate system. The tensor is a simple collection of objects. This is a very generic definition. Remember, tensors are much beyond this, right? So tensor is a simple collection of objects whose components transform in a nice way between coordinate changes. So let us understand tensor in this way. We are not going to understand the, uh, the rank of a tensor, the calculations, the operations of tensor. So it is a collection of objects whose components transform in a nice way between coordinate changes. This is just an example of a stress and tensor. So all the T's are the components of a tensor and T01 actually means mu0 and nu1 which I mentioned as the coordinates of space-time. So 0, 2, 0, 3 or so on. Okay, so few important points for a tensor is that a tensor is always the same in coordinate systems. Obviously, otherwise how will we measure? The components of a tensor may be different in different coordinates. An equation involving only tensor quantities is the same in all coordinate systems. So it's a little bit technical, but anyway, let us understand that is a kind of a measurement tool which will measure and if there are changes it will not mention it will measure the changes but it will be same for all coordinate systems okay so let us understand for example this is a flat space time okay we are just taking x and y coordinates uh, i would say euclidean or cartesian coordinate and we measure a vector which is a right we try to measure the components of the vector, the red one in y-axis, which is called ay, and the red one along the x-axis, which is called ax. Now, let us see what happens when we, so this is the blue arrow which is measuring the basis of vector, right? Now, what happens if we plot the same one in gray and then later in a curved space like x prime and y prime? The vector remains the same, right? A. Now what we do is that we try to measure the basis of the vector along the x-axis which is called a prime x and the basis of the y vector along the y-axis which is a prime y. Now if we measure the basis of vector what happens is that we find a prime x is a little bit longer than a x. We also find a prime y is a little bit longer than the original a y but we find a is invariant right so I think that this gives you a kind of a clear idea that from a flat space when we move to the curved space the basis of the vector changes however the vector remains the same 
Now, I will try to demonstrate with another example. This is the non-rotated coordinate system. We measure this one AX. We measure the AY. And you see these are the distances, right? Now, we take this one, which is a rotated frame axis. And you see what happens. A prime X a little bit bigger than the original AX. And this A prime Y is also a little bit shorter compared to the A prime Y. So the static frame of reference, once it gets rotated in a different frame of reference, the uh, I would say the basis of those vectors changes. Now exactly tensor does this rule that in spite of these changes, it creates a kind of a mathematical notation or I would say mathematical notion through which we can measure those changes. So we can tell that if the vector changes, obviously then there is a problem in measurement. So the vector, we have to keep it the same. The components of the vector changes and we develop a kind of a mathematical tool to measure them. Any mathematical entity which is invariant under rotation of coordinate system is called a tensor. Again, this definition is erroneous. However, I would like to tell that for the time being, in order to cover up this entire GR, this is important that the mathematical entity which is invariant under rotation of a coordinate system is called a tensor. Okay, now we come what is called metric tensor. What is metric tensor? Because it is considered to be the fundamental component of general relativity. We are going to look into this. Okay, so let us first understand that Metric tensor, in short, what we can tell is used to define lengths and other geometric properties in the of space time in general relativity. So, the metric generalizes these properties to any curved space. At, you can think of it as measuring rod or a scale. So, physically, the metric plays the role of the gravitational potential. So, in some sense, the metric is a mathematical tool uh, since it cannot be measured directly. Uh, this is just like the Newtonian gravitational position cannot be measured. Only the changes in it can. These changes we call gravitational forces. However, it still has a physical consequence. Calculating distances in a curved space time by defining a line element of the metric. So it is basically a line element of the metric which will help us to measure the distances. Just a quick kind of an idea uh, because all of you already know what is a line element. So it is basically uh, we can call it as a line segment which measures an infinite symbol displacement vector in a metric space. And we measure this as a function of the metric tensor. It is denoted by ds. So we get a curved space and a curvilinear coordinates like this. This red one is actually the line element. So the length of the line which may be thought of as a differential length or a differential arc length is a function of the metric tensor and we denote it by uh, ds. Okay, so now this is actually enough to define this notation. Uh, strictly speaking, the metric tensor is basically a dot. It is a dot protocol between two basis vectors, right? So usually though we think basis vectors are orthogonals, uh, but they are, uh, they are uh, they are at 90 degree angles, but in a curved space, it never generally happens. So here you see, it is a dot product. And uh, 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 the, this actually definition works in ordinary space, which is not curved, but in Euclidean space, that is. But more generally, in a curved space, the basis vectors may be uh, pointing in totally different and very, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, different arbitrary directions. So the metric tensor actually gives a kind of a measurement how the basis vectors are aligned, which is helps us to uh, determine the geomet geometry of the space time itself. So this is basically a dot product we are trying to find out, strictly speaking, because we are not into orthogonal measures and system. We are into what we call non-orthogonal non system, right? So it essentially tells how much the vectors are aligned. So just a kind of a measurement. These are the curved coordinates. And if you make we measure it by x mu and x nu, then these are the, uh, you know, vectors e mu and e nu so this is one g mu nu gives the dot product of e mu and e nu okay just a few important features of metric tensor 
metric tensor is basically a symmetric tensor. Why? Because this G1 and G10, G02 and G20, so on are same. So these actually gets cancelled out and we get G mu nu equals to G nu mu and this G mu nu is basically a four dimension of space time. So once we cancel out those common terms, we get a symmetric tensor. So we cancelling out, we get this. These are the 10 components, which means that the equation is still valid no matter what coordinates we select. Okay. So these are certain features of the metric tensor. So here are these, you know, uh, those components which we have talked about and the same kind of a component exists in stress energy momentum. Then. So this is just to give you an idea. Okay, now uh, we come to the most important part which I was talking in my previous videos which is called Christoffel symbols. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is very integral and central. Okay, so the, let us first understand the geometric meaning. So, Christoffel symbols are actually mathematical objects that describe how basis vectors change in a coordinate system. We have seen that basis vectors change, right? So, in general relativity, Christoffel symbols describe the change in the metric throughout space time. Therefore, they describe the acceleration experienced by an observer in the gravitational field. This is important. Why? Because when you are moving, along space time it is generating an acceleration and Christoffel symbols actually measures it. <coughs> Let us look into this equation. So this part is actually how much the basis vector e nu uh, e mu changes as we move along x nu and this one actually is the derivative where the e lambda part overlaps. Now if you remember this particular diagram which we just uh, saw uh, in a few uh, seconds ago you see this one this e mu and e nu. So you can now understand hope that g mu nu which gives a dot product of e nu which measures in which way I am going, uh, but, sorry, uh, uh, the basis vector e nu, <coughs> e nu which is moving, <coughs> in which direction it is moving, it is moving in the direction of x nu. So how much, I mean to say the, the degree, the basis vector is changing as we move along the coordinate, it can be, it is x nu. This is the essence of uh, the Christoffel symbol. Okay, so the Christoffel symbol, we can say it stores or it encodes how the basis vectors change throughout the space time, which helps us to do the measurement. Now, if it can also be defined in terms of metric tensor, why we are defining in terms of metric tensor? Because metric tensor is something which is central, right? Which measures the movement and we, if we can if we can represent it in terms of the uh, metric that is g then it becomes much easier so this is this is actually the um, the christoffel symbols in terms of uh, metric tensor so <clears throat> let us understand what it is so uh, physically christoffel symbols can be interpreted as describing fictitious forces arising from a non inertial frames of reference uh, Christopher symbols represent gravitational forces as they describe how the gravitational potential or the metric uh, varies through as it moves through space time. So now if we, if we, if you get a kind of an acceleration uh, if it is happening in any object so a gravitational field is described by the acceleration right an object would ex experience now follow this so it is a fictitious force and this fictitious force is called gravity gravity is due to the space-time curvature. Space-time curvature is measured by Christoffel symbols. Hence, Christoffel symbols can be called as gravitational fields. You see the very simple sequence, right? So, uh, Christoffel symbols now can describe changes in basis vectors and from fictitious force, uh, it is gravity. Gravity is due to space-time. Space-time is measured by Christoffel symbols and Christoffel symbols are the gravitational fields. So, Christoffel symbols are gravitational fields in general relativity. It's a very important way. I won't say interpretation, but this is, this is something very useful in terms of understanding. Okay, now what I am going to do is that I am going to draw a simple comparison between Newtonian physics and general relativity so that the understanding of Christoffel symbols is much more easier. Now, you see what happens is that if we take the Newtonian gravity, which is G, right? We denote it by G, not the metric tensor, the usual Newtonian mechanics G. 
and it is the negative gradient, right? So we can write the gravitational potential of Newtonian mechanics in this way. Also, we can compare it with the gravitational fields in general relativity uh, in terms of the metric that is G, right? So both of them are written in this way. Now, if you write them in uh, in uh, in this way, the Newtonian gravity, you see these are the partial derivatives in Newtonian gravity, right? And and these are the partial derivatives in general relativity. So once we compare this, the key idea is that the metric itself represents the gravitational potential in general relativity. Now, there might be a link between the Christoffel symbol and the Newtonian gravitational field that is called what is called the weak field limit. Okay, now what do we mean by weak field limit? I mean to say the weak field limit is basically nothing but when the entire system is moving in a very, 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 I would say what, in a very small, small manner, the gravitating forces, etc. are very weak. Now, I have shown in one of my videos, if, uh, if somebody is looking into GR, you will see that uh, from Newtonian gravity, we emerged and generalized general relativity. Which means the opposite is also true. What is that? GR can further go back to Newtonian mechanics. Now, with, with the calculations which we did, we find out that when GR moves into Newtonian mechanics, the, 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 the opposite manner, then it happens only with weak field limit or certain limitations. Because uh, in Newtonian gravity, things, uh, you know, they, they, we, it move a little bit slow. So the link between Christoffel symbols of Newtonian gravity and general relativity is basically the weak field limit through which it happens. Okay, now we come one by one into the tensor part of measuring the curvature. The first one would be the Riemann curvature tensor. So let us first ex uh, you know, experience in a very simple way. Riemann curvature tensor is the most standard way we can tell it uh, in terms of measuring the uh, curvature, right? Uh, it assigns a tensor in Riemannian manifold and it is important that ordinary partial derivatives commute but covariant derivatives do not. So what we will do is that Riemann curvature tensor is defined to measure the failure to commute. That means how much the measurement is not happening, that is what Riemann curvature tensor measures. This is what Riemann curvature tensor looks like and we are going to touch base with parallel transport covariant derivative Christopher symbol we have already dealt with. <coughs> okay. So Riemann curvature tensor gives a complete description of any curved space. It is basically the Ricci tensor which is contracted. I will give you a nice example you will understand. Now if you look into Einstein's field equations then you will know that there is a um, a Ricci tensor, there is a Ricci scalar, uh, there is a, a metric tensor, there is a stress energy momentum tensor. But the question is that where is Riemann curvature tensor? Right? The question mark shows that. You will see that actually this Ricci curvature tensor is actually a contraction of Riemann curvature tensor. That means Riemann curvature tensor is lying there hidden because the Ricci curvature tensor is contracted in this fashion. We'll explain you further that this, uh, for example, we are just using A, B, C. So this one is the Ricci tensor. This one is actually the Riemann curvature tensor. Now, because it is a contraction of first and third, the first one is this and third one is this. So contracted, we can write it in this way. That is R sub A, B. So I think it is clear that if you if you really want to see the Riemann curvature tensor, the Ricci tensor is actually what you are seeing, the Riemann curvature tensor. In order to avoid mathematical complications, we have contracted the first one, that is C, and the third one, which is C, and we are making this R sub AB, right? So we can call it in this way, if you write, that each component of the Ricci tensor is just the sum of multiple components of Riemann tensor. So, here now we come to a concept which is called parallel transport. Now, why we want parallel transport? Let me make it clear for that. If we if we just want to measure two vectors, okay, and we want to say, okay, tell me which vector is longer, which vector is shorter, are they same? So what we do is that we slide one vector onto the another. 
if it matches, we say that fine, the two vectors are the same. But in this figure, you see these two vectors, one is bigger and this one is smaller, right? This is another way. But if we get a kind, so it is a way of comparing vectors at different positions in manifold. It is also a way of transporting data, which we will see what we mean in a smooth surface in manifold. Now, for example, we are taking a kind of a flat surface, a triangle, that is a Euclidean space, right? Now we take a vector, which is the blue one, and we are starting at this red dot, that is the origin. Now what we need to do is that we want to transport the data uh, along this closed surface keeping the uh, keeping keeping the direction to be the same so we move with this this way we move in this way then again this then we further go this with this go this and this and then finally we come at the red point that is the origin so the conclusion is that in flat space when we parallel transport a vector it comes back to the original place that means we have parallelly successfully parallelly transported it. We will see that the value comes to zero, what we mean by parallel transport. But in case of a sphere, say I am standing right over here, right, with a red dot, and I want to move it here, which is the blue one. And what I have to do, my mission is to keep an arrow or something which is pointing out to be the same. I mean to say, it, it, it cannot, it cannot um, change, right? So I try to keep it same, the V, the vector, and I move in this way. I'm trying to keep it as straight as possible, but still it is moving. Why? Because of this curvature. Then I try to move in, in this uh, this uh, great circle. I'm trying to keep it straight and I move this, this, this. So the direction of the vector V changes due to the curvature. Right? Then again I try to move in this uh, green direction. I'm trying to keep it straight, straight, straight. And here I finally come, that is this, uh, this, uh, this blue one. So what happens, the starting vector and the ending vector are not the same. What we found out in Euclidean space, transporting the vector and then the triangle, we end it at the same way, but these are not the same. Now, if we take out these two vectors and we measure the distance, there is a formidable distance, right? And this V and V prime are not the same. So this one is what Riemann tensor does. So the Riemann tensor describes the change of all the components, this vector in space-time direction. So if you see the big, uh, big equation that is Riemann curvature tensor, this one is actually this one. Okay, and what we get is this: the Riemann curvature tensor gives a complete description of tidal forces of general relativity. So you can, it is now clear, right, that. If we try to parallelly transport, if we cannot, and the difference between the starting and the ending vector is some, some, some amount of a difference which the property describes. So, what we get is now we come what is called a parallel transport and a covariant derivative. We have just started with parallel transport, but we face a problem with parallel transport which we are going to find it a solution with a new term called covariant derivative. Let us find it out how. We have seen this picture, right? So we tried to parallelly transport the vector, but it was not possible. So the parallel transport keep cannot keep the vectors to be the same, obviously. So here we use a new term, which is called a covariant derivative. Very important to understand, we are using again a term which is called co. Co means the variant will be in regard to something so that we can measure again and we get a complete theory of general relativity. Note that in my previous video, I have shown that it was Einstein who was not aware about covariance and tensor. It was his friend Marcel Grossman who introduced to this term of tensor and uh, I have shown the papers of in original German which shows that how Grossman introduced tensor and then Einstein came to know about tensor and Riemannian manifold and he introduced and uh, introduced and I would say implemented tensor to find a covariant theory of gravity. So here we find again a covariant derivative. It looks like this, this uh, opposite the Nabla operator. This shows the direction, this shows the vector field and it measures the rate of change of vector field which means that covariant derivative is actually a tool which helps us to find parallel transported vector fields. So there is a problem with the vector field. We have discovered a tool which is called a covariant derivative which measures the transported vector fields. Few important points will make it further clear. 
A parallel transport obviously cannot keep vectors constant. It is impossible if you measure the vector field uh, on a constant curved surface. Parallel transport keeps vectors as constant as we move one by one. In flat space, covariant derivative is just the ordinary derivative and covariant derivative helps us to find parallel transported vector fields. Covariant derivative is a generalization of the directional derivative of vector calculus. So, if you are aware about vector calculus, you know what is directional derivative. So, it further generalizes and makes it much, much, much broader. So, this one is actually the uh, in flat space. You see, it is just an origin, ordinary derivative followed by this Nabla term. And if it is zero, which happens in case of a triangle, which I have shown you, it means that the vector v is parallelly transported, successfully parallelly transported in the direction w. And that is shown in the Euclidean space. So that is why it is zero. So these are few important points, right? So we try to keep the vector constant uh, as we move step by step. In flat space, covariant is just the ordinary derivative, which is shown in this equation. And covariant derivative helps us to find parallel transported fields just it is a generalization of the directional derivative as we do in vector calculus. Okay, so derivatives work differently obviously in curved space. In curved coordinates apart from the components of the vector they are, this function changes. Covariant derivative which is the generalization of an ordinary derivative works in any coordinate system. Obviously if it is a generalization definitely it would work in any coordinate system. The covariant derivative fixes, it finds out that since it takes into account the coordinate changes and it is a kind of a correlation which tries to measure and takes care of the derivative. So here is the covariant derivative. This term is the ordinary derivative. This is, uh, which we have already seen is the Christoffel symbol, uh, extra term used in order to know the coordinate system change. You see how it moves, the mu remains at the top and the lambda moves to this part. And we can say in general relativity, it is a covariant version of the ordinary derivative. In general, ordinary partial derivatives are not covariant in nature. Uh, these are some of the important points. You can pause, take a snapshot and write down or whatever you want to do. This is important that covariant derivative is the generalization of ordinary derivative and it tries to fix the change and it takes care of the derivative also. We use the Christoffel symbol in order to denote the coordinate system. However, in it is also the ordinary derivative in other ways. So summarize covariant derivatives should replace all the ordinary derivatives when we are dealing with curved space time. Uh, in order to uh, obtain a general covariant law, we need to replace all the ordinary derivatives with covariant derivatives. In general relativity, we are dealing with curved space the ordinary derivative obviously won't be useful. We have to measure it. Uh, we have to replace it with covariant derivatives. We come to the next uh, tensor part, which is uh, very important. Uh, this is again very central to uh, what we called uh, measuring the curvature and it is called the Ricci curvature tensor and Ricci scalar. I have made a video earlier uh, which is called components of Einstein's field equations where I have also dealt in details about Ricci curvature tensor. So again a very layman definition and a visualization Ricci curvature tensor measures how a shape is deformed as it moves along the geodesic. Now you might be wondering that how a shape is deformed. A shape is a shape right? I will show you certain examples which will make it clear. So this is a curved space time space and these are the curvilinear coordinates. We start here and we try to reach that uh, black dot and see the, 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 the geodesic or the line uh, changes. Again, we start here, try to reach the red, uh, sorry, the black dot and you see what happens that the two initial parallel geodesics, we remember geodesics as straight lines, shortest lines, they try to deviate. Right? So, in the presence of the curvature, which you might now call as the presence of gravity, these geodesics start to deviate. The space-time volume starts to change. We will see how it changes. Before that, a quick uh, review on Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, it leads to Ricci curvature tensor. Ricci curvature is symmetric and here is the Ricci curvature. So, uh, Ricci scalar is a contraction of Ricci tensor. 
which is a contraction of Riemann tensor. So <laughs> this is funny, right? So here you see that Ricci curvature is a contraction of uh, Riemann curvature tensor. So, uh, so we get the Ricci, which is a contraction of Ricci tensor, which is again a contraction of Riemann. That means if we go back from Riemann, we get to Ricci curvature tensor, which gives back to the Ricci scalar. So all these mind it contraction etc are being done in order to make life easy, the mathematical calculations easier. Remember, I was talking about the uh, Einstein's uh, journey into tensor analysis. It was helped by Marcel Grossman immensely and one of his friend Michel Besso. Now, this is Gregorio Ricci Curbastro, Italian uh, mathematician who developed uh, Ricci calculus or Ricci uh, cur uh, tensor calculus independently. So, Ricci curvature tensor tracks how volume changes along geodesics. That means it grows and shrinks. So, depending on the curvature, positive, negative, we will see Ricci curvature shows number one, it is static. That means no change in volume has happened. It is growing. That means there is a change or it is shrinking or decreasing. That means also there is a change. So, this change in the volume is being denoted by Ricci curvature. Okay, let us see an example. Now, here is uh, a sphere and we are moving along this. These two people uh, seems to meet at a point at North Pole. We get some kind of a same, same. We, the, these two geodesics are converging at one point and we get a kind of a sphere. And if you move up, you see it shrinks further, further and further. So what happens is that this R actually denotes the shrinking or the change in volume right so the ball shrinks in size as it moves along geodesics and that is what i was calling that the change in the volume is measured by ricci uh, tensor and that is means it has got a positive curvature so the shrinking happens for the positive curvature what happens for a negative curvature we will see so this is a flat space right and i move this object here so what happens here is that ricci is zero why? Obviously, there is no change in volume. So, it is a straight geodesic. Now, I gave it a kind of a converged geodesics, right? So, here it further shrinks, shrinks, shrinks here. And you see it's almost reduced one fourth. Why? If the Ricci curvature is greater than zero, right? It is kind of a converged geodesic. Now, if you get a kind of a volume, something like this, you will see here what is happening. It is diverging, it is increasing, increasing. Further it increases. Why? Because the Ricci curvature is less than zero. So these are the three cases in which the geodesic or the object that it is moving, it is changing. So the Ricci scalar, now this is basically what we dealt with, the change in volume. Uh, let us go back. Uh, yeah. So change in volume, it is done the, through this, right? Now what we do is that, we come to Ricci scalar, this, this one. Uh, it, it, this actually keeps track how the size of a ball deviates from standard Euclidean space. If this is a flat circle, it becomes this as a disk. And on the sphere, what we try, we try to impose this disk over here, right? And we see that the area that fits on the sphere is more than which fits in a flat space. So area is more on the sphere than compared to a flat space. Okay, so here the area is pi r square. Now the area increases. We are we are we're just trying to trying to fit this circle in a curved space, and the surface area increases as the now the ball is shrinking. The surface area is increasing, and here <coughs> it increases almost two pi r square. So what we can say is that as the circle becomes shorter, we can fit in more area. Hence we can say that we can fit large amount of area in a small place or a small boundary. This is what is a function of Ricci scalar. For the illustration, we'll make it clear. So this, when the, uh, this is r equals to zero, it increases, r becomes more than zero. In the saddle surface, r is less than zero. So it has got a less area. If you can see this one, less area. Now, three cases, there is no increases volume, Ricci is equals to zero. There is a volume decrease because of a sphere, positive convergence and for a saddle shape or when it diverges, I would say uh, the volume increases and R becomes less than zero. 
So again, just a quick overview. This is the Ricci uh, tensor, which we have contracted. We have shown it earlier, the first and the third. And this is the sum of the multiple components. Okay. Now, so we have covered the tens the curvature part, but we are not done yet. These are measuring the curvatures, but uh, what is causing the curvature? These are measures, but what is causing the curvature? This is what the stress energy momentum tensor does. So, we need to understand that as per the special theory of relativity, mass we know is just another form of energy, right? From E equals to mc squared. Now, the question suggests that gravity should really be caused by any type of energy, right? And not just this own one special form of mass. So, yes, it is. Gravity should be caused by all types of energy, right? Not only that, it also caused by energy fluxes, as we know, or the momentum fluxes. So, energy flux, as we know, is the rate of transfer of energy through a surface, depending upon the context. And this T mu nu actually denotes how four momentum flows through space-time. I hope you understand about four momentum. This is just a, a generalization. We have learned it in uh, special relativity. So <clears throat> these are described by the mathematical object. This is T mu nu, the energy momentum tensor, which tells us the four momentum flow through space and time. Yeah. So four momentum, you know, the three directions with time, it has been just made into four. Now, this is something which I just wanted to show you. So <clears throat> here what happens is that the energy momentum tensor, although P, let us describe it as P, uh, it is coming through this, it is going through this, and again it is coming out through this. So if you consider the continuity equation, which describes that how things are transported, we will find it is equals to zero. So the covariant divergence of the stress energy tensor is zero. Why it is zero? Because it relates to the conservation law, right? And here we say that in general relativity, where space-time is curved, the continuity equation in the differential form, obviously, involves the covariant divergence. Obviously, this is the covariant divergence instead of the instead of the uh, ordinary divergence. So, the continuity equation for energy momentum tensor is a statement of energy and momentum conservation in general relativity, which I have just shown you. Okay, so now what I will do is that I will just dissect this uh, tensor form and I will try to show you uh, what all those are. So first of all, this one, uh, um, this is the energy density and you will see this is because of the EMC squared. It is much, much larger. It is the highest in terms of any other components, right? Uh, right. So the next which comes is this one. This is called the energy flux. Uh, this one, um, a new, this denotes the space-time direction. Mu denotes which components of the four momentum we are considering, right? This red part is the momentum density. I'm not explaining those terms. I think you know what is energy density, energy flux, and momentum density. This one is the shear stress part. And this one is the pressure, right? So in most cases, these shear stress compounds will be zero, right? Don't worry on that in case in case of perfect fluids, which will have no internal stresses. So uh, these, the pressure components also plays an important role if you're studying the structure of stars, like the stellar interiors, etc. that come. So this is kind of a component-wise component. What are the things that are involved? Now, <laughs> something very important, uh, you know, very, very, very interesting. This part, those who know, I think you already know, this is called the Cauchy stress, stress tensor, right? And what we can say is that energy momentum is just a relativistic extension of the Cauchy stress tensor, right? Because we are just expressing the Cauchy stress tensor in a relativistic tensor format. So we can call it, it might be erroneous, I don't know, we can call it as an extension of the Cauchy stress tensor. Okay, now we come to denote the most important part which is called the tidal forces. Now, this is a kind of a demonstration which I think you know that tidal forces actually uh, can be seen when the rise, rise of the sea level, right, uh, which is causing the moon's gravity. Now, tidal forces are always represented when an object in a gravitational field and this may cause the object to get deformed, I mean to say, uh, sphagidified or something. 
the moon here it is written the moon exerts at ideal force is quite simple we learnt it in the school days right okay so the newtonian mechanics actually uh, explains tidal force as different parts of the body which is getting stretched out right so in general relativity tidal forces are explained by the fact uh, 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 that different parts of an object will follow their geodesics through space time this is important so these geodesics may begin deviating from one another we have seen that which is measured by riemann curvature tensor due to the gravity which causes the objects to deform and physically observe tidal forces so uh, um, i think that a little bit of a demonstration will become easier so the key idea is what everything in space time moves along geodesics so if the if the space time is curved objects under the influence of gravity so these geodesics correspond to the different trajectories so now if i am moving in this way say for example if the gravitational speed so if i am here then if i am moving this trajectory my head will be uh, you know pulling pulling towards this right so my head is moving along this geodesics which will feel the tidal force the feet is moving along this geodesics what will happen eventually is an effect of the tidal force i will get squeezed okay and this is exactly what happens i mean to say tidal forces combined with gravity it near the black hole if you have watched my video or no i have not covered sphagnification but but the, if you watch my video black hole in my playlist in general relativity you will find a complete understanding of black hole anyway so <clears throat> technically what i can say that each part of my body will have a own geodesic which is moving and we will look at uh, this in a mic uh, macroscopic area uh, context Ma we can say that the effect of these tidal forces in general relativity are described by the geodesic deviation equation and we will see now what is a geodesic deviation so this is the geodesic deviation equation okay each component of the vector tells you about uh, each space time direction so the entire left part is the covariant acceleration of the separation vector why covariant because otherwise we won't be able to measure it we need a kind of a covary something with something the right hand side uh, describes uh, the acceleration for the riemann tensor the two two four velocities this one denotes the separation vector don't worry separation vector we will soon see it the the separation vector between two these two geodesics this is obviously the riemann curvature tensor and this denotes four velocities of the objects moving along the geodesics so more or less all the terms in this particular equation we know except the separation vector let us look into it so we draw a same coordinate right curve space time and we draw those curvilinear coordinates we use the same analogy that a body or uh, something which is moving uh, meets at this point and we start moving and it deviates why it deviates it deviates due to curvature right so now you see what happens this two initial parallel geodesics deviated now here you see the blue one this blue arrow which is pointing down is the separation vector points uh, from the geodesic to one another now you see i have just uh, given that example of uh, geodesic deviation the left hand side so top so the geodesic equation deviation tells how uh, this separation vector would accelerate as the two particles or two geodesics deviate due to space time curvature i hope it is clear now so the deviation that measurement of how much it deviates that is what the geodesic deviation equation will tell and the riemann curvature tensor is involved and the deviation is involved the proper time is involved and all those things so this is why ge geodesic deviation now now if you go back let us go back okay let us further go back now you see what happens this geodesic deviation that my head is moving in this way my feet is being dragged in this way this deviation is being measured by this one or or more geometrically in this place right so it is now clear that why tidal forces and these tidal forces result into deviation and which equation measures the deviation 
Finally, we come to the last question. What is Einstein field equation used for? Now, we, are, we obviously understand that an Einstein equation is an equation. But most important is that what it helps to do. So, the, basically the Einstein field equation describes how energy momentum causes the curvature itself and curvature is described by the different curvature tensors we have read which are still built by the metric. And uh, simply we can say Einstein field equations determine the metric uh, looks like for a given space time depending on the energy content of uh, the space time. Now, we obviously to get the metric we uh, solve the um, uh, tensors and all those things but remember one thing that field equations are set of extremely complicated non-linear second order partial differential equations we know that Carl Schwarzschild first produced the exact solution of Einstein's field equations but that too was a spherically symmetric non-rotating non-chargeable body if you take uh, non symmetries it becomes further difficult so you get a charge, it becomes difficult. You get a rotating black hole, it becomes further difficult. You get a, a non-spherical mass, it becomes further difficult. So we use computers nowadays, we use softwares, etc. to uh, solve field equations. And very recently I launched a video on Roger Penrose. He took a different approach, geometric approach, which you can look into it. Now, so what we do? What we do is that we assume certain things. The first thing is that we can get a solution from what is called a vacuum solution. A vacuum solution describes space-time which contains, say for example, no matter. Nothing is there, right? It is vacuum. So T mu nu, stress energy tensor becomes zero. So but the space-times but still be curved. Still be curved, right? So examples are what? Schwarzschild metric or a non-rotating black hole or space-time around a rotating object, something like that. The second one is weak field solutions, which I have been talking. This is where gravity is slightly a little bit more, you know, the metric is deviating a little bit. We call it as a linearized gravity. The gravity which is linear, so it will become easier, right? And it is used to study gravitational waves and a certain thing, but it is much easier. Third one is called symmetric solutions. Symmetric solutions are basically have a large portion of symmetry. That means everything is symmetric. Symmetric sphere, uh, non-rotating, uh, which carries a lot of symmetry. For example, uh, 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 Schwarzschild metric is a symmetric um, uh, example. Homogeneity is there. Isotropic is there. Friedman Robertson Walker uh, metric is there. So these are all metrics which actually becomes easy. So uh, I mean to say, now you understand that we have to assume certain things. Either we assume that it is vacuum, no matter is present, we plug in those parameters, we get the solution. Second is that we assume it is a weak field, gravity is slight and there is a slight metric deviation, not much. We get Einstein field equations. Third one is that there is a symmetric solution, which Schwarzschild and other uh, people used it, it becomes easier. So this, so this is basically that in order to cur in order to in order to calculate the curvature and everything, we assume those things. If you don't, then things become difficult. So that's it. I think the video has been quite extensive, a little bit longer. So what we have understood is that a quick summary: why is general relativity important? Then we took a quick detour, a quick kind of an overview. What are the postulates of relativity? Why tensor is fundamental in and what is that fundamental metric tensor? We have also learned Christoffel symbols which measures the acceleration. Uh, simple uh, kind of a comparison between Christoffel symbols and Newtonian gravity. What is Riemann curvature tensor, Ricci curvature and Ricci scalar? We have also seen how Re Riemann curvature tensor is a contraction of Ricci and how it is hidden. We have also seen parallel transport, uh, which we try to parallelly transport, but we cannot. There is a change in the starting and the ending vector, and we use a tool which is called covariant derivative. The source of entire gravity is stress energy momentum tensor. The tidal forces, how this phagetification happens, and these tidal forces, the deviations are measured by geodesic deviation and the and the what you call that uh, uh, that uh, that limit that. Uh, what you call the deviation that part is being measured and the typical usage of Einstein field equations assuming certain limits, assuming certain 
uh, spherical, non-symmetric vacuum solutions and others. So I think I am done with this one video which comprises everything. Do subscribe, like and click on the bell icon to get all the notifications from Physics for Students. And please put up your comments regarding this video. This is Sean X signing off and promising to come up with another interesting video very soon. Stay safe, stay happy and best wishes. Now, you can be a part of our team. You can send your scientific articles, essays, research papers, lesson plans on a particular subject of science. For further details, please write to us at editor at physicsforstudents.com. Stay safe and happy.